Hey, what is up everyone? It's David here. US inflation rate was above 4% in April and the last time it was that high, it was in 2012. Part of the key driver for such a high inflation is because of the chip shortage, driving used cars and trucks, prices up 10% in April. That's probably going to pass, but the disruption in our global supply chain is here to stay, at least for another while. That means there's likely going to be more money chasing fewer goods, driving inflation higher, at least until the supply chain is fixed. Okay, cool story, bro. How does that impact me? If inflation gets too high for a long period of time, central banks might be forced to raise interest rates and that's going to absolutely crush portfolios purely holding stocks. We already saw high growth names like Zip correcting 40% and more, Affirm correcting close to 60% and Airbnb close to around 40% as well. And I personally believe when we get our new inflation numbers, people are gonna freak out again. And I think it's highly likely that we will see another correction. So in this video, let's talk about what asset classes we can use to beat inflation what I have done to my portfolio so far so that we can get through this period on the other side as even better investors. And towards the end of this video, I'll show you how I screen for stocks that will do well in a high inflation environment. As usual, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. It's just general information for entertainment purposes. And without further ado, let's go. So this graph you see in front of you, JP Morgan have looked at 33 years worth of data and assessed how asset classes have performed in different environments. Now you can see the middle line that the median inflation over these 33 years is around 2.5%. And low and rising inflation only happened four times between 1988 to 2020. What tends to do well in the past are equities or alternatives, commodities or gold. Before you go, oh, so stonks are back on the table? Not all of them, but the ones with strong cash flow and pricing power, like for example, Apple, they can cop the rising input costs, raise the prices, and people will still buy the iPhones and iMacs. But the ones without strong cash flows and might need to tap the equity or debt market for money, they are gonna have a pretty tough time in a rising inflation environment. So let's look at some actual numbers and the impact on these asset classes. If you look at the table in front of you, and shout out to Professor Demondaran from NYU, you can see that in decades where inflation is really high, like for example, during the 70s, that absolutely ate away all of the real returns that stocks can provide. And it doesn't really get better for T-bills or bonds. But in decades where inflation is anywhere between one to two to 3%, stocks have provided relatively reasonable returns. A real return, by the way, is taking into account inflation and nominal returns is not taking into account inflation. Okay, so now let's take a look at gold and real estate. So during periods of really, really high inflation during the 70s, that is the golden period for gold. Real returns was 30% and is around 1% for real estate. It's worthwhile noting that since the 70s, a lot has changed. Globalization and technology have helped us keep inflation down. And with the rise of new digital assets or collectibles, it's given institutional investors more choice when it comes to choosing asset classes that can store value, not correlated with the rest of the asset classes that we know of. I know that most of you are only interested in stocks, so I'll keep the digital asset conversation with just my patrons or I'll save it for another day. Access to gold is pretty straightforward. I've already done a video on that, so I left the link in the description box below for any of you who are interested. And before I show you how I screen for companies that is likely to do well in a rising inflation environment, let me just show you what I've done to my portfolio so far to protect myself against inflation. Now, I think it's really important for you to know that the changes that I've made is specific to my risk tolerance, my time horizon, and what I personally are interested in. It's not recommendation or advice for anyone to do anything. For my Australian portfolio, I think I am incredibly fortunate that I started it off as a dividend growth investor. So a big portion of my portfolio is actually in Australian stuff. And the good thing being an Australian investor is that our blue chips are going to be really resilient in a rising inflation environment. So think of the industrials, the miners, and also the banks are going to be relatively stable. At the same time, one of you did make a comment a few videos ago mentioning that in a high inflation, high interest rate environment, it might incur more costs for the banks if the property investors can no longer afford the loans. And I think that's a great point. Even though interest rates 
can potentially help the banks make more money, it might also hurt them just because of how exposed they are to home loans. I'm happy with what I have and I didn't really make that many changes over here from an inflation point of view. Now for my US portfolio, there are a lot more growth exposure over here and I did cut down a lot of it. I'm not gonna go through all of the different positions, but really I have added more into value stocks like for example, Bristol Myers and also CVS and a few commodity exposure as well. To give you a more holistic view of my portfolio, I have dropped my growth percentage from around 35 to around 28%. So I am trying to get it down to around 25 to about 20% and Part of that challenge would be potentially just adding more into value and I would be comfortably be able to sit through any drawdowns, not a problem. I've reallocated the position I closed in growth into either value or I left some of it in cash just so that if there's any opportunities, I can capitalize on it. I think there's nothing worse when it comes to seeing the opportunity and cannot pull the trigger because I have no liquidity. So I think I'm happy with where things are at at the moment. Okay, so the next question is, if stocks can perform well in a rising inflation environment, well, what stocks? And Warren Buffett is gonna help us out with that question. Well, the businesses that will perform the best are the ones that require little capital investment to facilitate inflationary growth and that have strong positions that allow them to increase prices with inflation. The key takeaway for me really is the pricing power. Given that S&P 500 or even Australian companies are expensive based on most measures, and just to give you some perspective of how expensive it is, the 25 year average for S&P 500 is around a 16 forward PE. Currently is trading at around a 22 times. The price you pay for things are going to be even more important moving forward and high quality stock selection is going to be key for returns. Let's go through a screening example. So when it comes to how I screen for high quality companies, I've talked about my system in the past and this will be more of an extension onto that system. Now I tried to look for a screener that is free so that we can all use it, but unfortunately with the capabilities or the criteria I'm looking for, it's, it's hard to find something that is free, but I still wanna walk you through my thought process so that you can see how I'm screening for these companies. First thing is, with US companies, I prefer the market cap to be greater than 5 billion because 1 billion is like small cap for US, right? Whereas small cap for here in Australia is 400 to around a billion dollar mark. For US companies, I like it to be a little bit more mature, like closer to 10 billion would be even better, but I left market cap to be greater than 5 billion here. The second criteria is EV free cash flow. Now, the reason why we use enterprise value is because it takes into account debt. And I like this number to be between zero to 16 times, because if I just pull out my calculator, if we do the inverse of 16 times, when it comes to free cash flow yield, about 4% is incredibly good. And we want to be a little bit higher than 4% because what if the interest rates go up? You know, would they have enough cash flow to pay off the additional debt? So we would prefer a higher EV free cash flow in these rising inflation environments. And then the PE ratio and the average PE is just to help us filter out companies. And the EPS, the earnings per share forecast, CAGR, greater than 0% is going to remove any companies that are anticipated to have lower earnings over the next two years. That's just to help us screen. And then what I'd like to do after that is I will prioritize them based on whether the 10 year average PE is more than the current PE. And if that is the case, it seems like to me that they're not being valued compared to their traditional PE, which over 10 years, right? So that indicates an opportunity. So let me zoom out a bit. And then the next thing I look for is the EPS forecast. If you look at some of the EPS forecasts here, 197% is too good to be true. Most of the time, when it's like that, I tend to ignore it because if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So above 50%, I try to avoid, or you can dig into it if you like, but frankly speaking, those are not sustainable. The next thing that I also ignore is that I don't like it when there is a huge amount of total debt to total capital. So you can see that there is a 73% debt on total capital. So imagine that if ultimately interest rates go up, that interest payment is gonna be pretty expensive. 
But in saying that, they're EV free cash flow six times, which means that they're generating a crap ton of cash flow. They will be able to handle that kind of debt payments, but that's no go for me. So I'll put X's next to them. The next one that is somewhat reasonable is CNC, and that's the ticker. When I encounter a company like this, where the EPS forecast is rel relatively reasonable and there seems to be an opportunity, the next thing I like to do is come to Morningstar Premium. Uh, there's a 30 day free trial. So I'm on free trial at the moment and I'm honestly loving this tool. And one of the things I look for is, does Morningstar think that they are currently undervalued? And it also tells you a mo and bunch of research as well. So this is actually really handy to you know catch up on research relatively quickly. And you can see that they think this is worth 85 bucks, but it's currently at 73. Okay, cool. You should always take this with a grain of salt because they, that might never pan out the way you expect. But that kind of just tells me that, okay, there might be an opportunity here that I should spend a little bit more time on. And then the next fact check that I do is I come to tip ranks and then I type in whatever the ticker is. And what I'm looking for is not the consensus. I'm looking for the amount of analysts that's covering the company. I'm looking for eight to 10 analysts covering the company because it shows there's some signs of institutional interest. When there are very little coverage on it, it's gonna be a tough, tough road. So that's just my own personal preference. The one last step that I do before I invest even more time into looking into the business model so on and so forth is, let me zoom out a little bit. I have built a very, very simple DCF model for my patrons because I think investing is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to keep you engaged. And I just wanted people to learn more about valuation, right? And so I kept everything very, very simple. I, I built out bear case, base case, and bull case because ultimately, things just don't pan out the way you expect. It's better to manage a set of probabilities and built in margin of safety in this model so that you can decide whether you wanna invest more time into researching. So let's go through an example here and I've already done some of the hard work. The ticker is CNC and the tax rate, you get it from ticker. And the way to get tax rate is you go to financials, go to income statement, you scroll down, you can see the effective tax rate over time it's anywhere between 25 to around 30%. Okay, cool. So I put in 30% here. When it comes to the discount rate, the way to think about it is that if it's a high growth company, high risk, then you wanna up your discount rate. And if it's a more mature company, more safe, generating a lot of cash flow like CNC, then we'll go with something a little bit lower, like 6.5 to around 7%. Of course, if you work in the finance industry, this is not going to cut it. They do their own calculations. It's more precise, taking into account cost of equity and cost of debt. But for the purpose of us retailers getting into the market and learning about it, uh, let's keep it simple and then build on top of it. And then the perpetual growth rate is basically the assumption is that over time, the company is gonna grow to a certain point and then it'll plateau. The plateau percentage that they'll continue to grow at usually people pick the country GDP, like for example, 2.5% for the US. I put 3% here and then EV a bit done multiple is we we'll go to ticker again, scroll up, we'll go to valuation and then we go to next 12 month EV a bit done. Look at a five year average and the mean is around eight times. Okay, cool. So we we'll put eight times here. Now, transaction day is whatever, whatever the date you're doing the model on. And then the fiscal year end, you got a ticker, you check it again. Uh, and then this is step two, step three, and step four. Now I've already done the hard work and put in the numbers. I've also put the source on where you get the numbers as well, just so that you know where you're looking for it. And then the third step is really where we want to think about how the company will grow. I'll give you an example. So if we're looking at operating cash flow, so we'll go to estimates and then we'll look at operating cash flow which is here, the company is growing, anticipated to grow at 17%. Now you can see that it, w it went through a decline and then a very sharp rise. It seems like to me that they might have acquired a company. This is where we built in our margin of safety. And let's just say that the bull case is 17%. And then we'll say, you know what? The base case is 10% and the bear case is around 5%. So this is where we're kind of managing our own expectation, right? I'm not that rosy, okay? And then capex as a percentage of operation cash flow, operating cash flow. What you can do is just do this number divided by the cash cash from operations to get a percentage. For the purpose of this, I 
express capex as a percentage of operating cash flow just to make it a little bit easier to get started learning about valuation and it turns out that 16 percent is generally what the company spends of their operating cash flow into capex that's relatively reasonable and low right and then their bid growth rate so let's scroll up look at the bid growth rate they are anticipated to grow their bid by 23 percent on a year-on-year -year basis Again, this is where we manage our expectation. Let's just say that best case scenario, things pan out and it goes according to plan and they grow at 23%. So that would be the bull case. But let's just say things don't go according to plan and the base case is around 10%. 5%, just in case they messed up. Okay, cool. Now, if you change this, let's say we'll change this. These models will change, right? So these are automatic already. And there are base case, bear case and bull case. Um, scenarios this will be version one i will add more features uh, ongoingly and i'm using my patreon to test out uh, whether if it's too complicated so on and so forth and i'll love your feedback if you have any uh, feedback for me in the comment section below now the final step is assigning a probability to each of the cases this is where doing your research is really important if you haven't quite dig into the company enough we can logically think about this that we've been quite bearish when it comes to some of the assumptions that we've made so there are inbuilt margin of safety right so we can assume that hey it's it's not likely that the bear case will happen but let's just assign a 15 percent to it anyway and because we've been building in our margin of safety throughout the model then it's more likely for the base case to happen so i've assigned a 70 percent to the base case and let's just say things pan out really well and it goes according to what the analysts are estimating let's say we'll give it a 15 percent the expected upside taking into account the probability is around 128 bucks on top of the current price and the internal rate of return is approximately 29 percent now this model is not here to help you make decisions but it's more around is the potential upside worth my time to learn more about the company that is what this model is intended for after you've done that initial work the question is does the company have pricing power and from my research it seems like they do but let me know in the comment section below what is your own process what do you look for and how have you structured your portfolio to beat inflation coming up Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you want to support the channel, not to mention access to additional content pieces and be part of my fortnightly Q&A, consider supporting the channel via Patreon. Nevertheless, if you have learned something new, remember to gently smack the like button right there, subscribe to my channel so that when I release future videos, you be the first one to know. Until next time, my name is David. Otto will always do the honors and see you very, very soon.